people around you. You'll never be able to get that job. You'll never be able to graduate. You're doing nothing. <laughs> but thank God that he saw the best in you and he saw the best in me. <laughs> because he only sees the best in me and you. That's his affirmation to who we are. As a matter of fact, the affirmation that we get is, for God so loved this world that he sent his only begotten son. Wait, 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 let's break that down. Let's unpack this. I, I unpack things. That's what I do. That's what I do for a living. That's what I do. I went to school. I got a little piece of paper that says I'm an organizational psychologist. What does that mean exactly? I go into organizations, I go into groups, and I unpack. Did you hear what I said? I unpack what the problem is so that we can all be on the same page and move forward and receive that goal that we all want to receive and get. So if the organization calls me and says, you know, Dr. Jean, Dr. Kennedy, you know, we're having a problem. We're having some low productivity here. We cannot seem to motivate our folks to come in. And for the amount of work that they put out as a business, I'm losing this. I, I don't have these, these people are motivated. What do I need to do? What do I need to do? Huh? Or we make it an organization that says, I am doing, I am, we're doing the best that we can. But it seems like we're just not able to meet our goals and objectives. Or we get a family who says, we're stuck. We just don't know which way to go. We've tried everything and it's not working. It's not working. We, we, we're going to have to take some other alternatives, whatever that means. And I have to go in there and put on my organizational psychology hat, my psychology hat, the stuff that I teach my students. I have to go in now and be a practitioner. It no longer becomes theory. It becomes hands-on, and I have to look and not just see the problem, but I have to see the solution. And I have to get them from point A to point Z. That's what I'm talking about. Mm, 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 mm. Do you know the kind of heavy lifting that is? Do you know what it means when people have no hope to be able to say, you have hope, there's a little bit of life over here, don't throw it away? We can make this work. Let us set up a strategic plan. Let's figure out how we get from point A to point B. Look, there's still some life. Don't give up on your employees. There's still some life. Don't give up on your family. There is still some life. Don't give up on your organization. There is still some life. And even God recognized that because God said, if I can find one Moses, Noah, oh my God. I have started preaching. Yeah. Uh, Lord, I want to teach today. Yeah. Help me, Holy Spirit, to just get out what you have to say because yeah. this is not even the dog message I had. Yeah. What, what is going on? What is going on? God said, if I could find one, give me one. Give, Moses, give me one. One, 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 because I will destroy this nation. For all that I have done for Israel, you mean to say I took them from Pharaoh's land, brought them through the Red Sea, brought them in, and all these people, can, these ungrateful people can say is send us back to Pharaoh. At least when we were at Pharaoh's house, we at least knew we weren't going to be out here and dying. My God. God looked at his creation. And he says, I'll wipe the whole lot of you out. I created you. I can wipe you out. And Noah stood up and said, God, no, 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 God, please, God, don't wipe us out. Give us another chance. I know we're foolish, but help us, God. Look, remember, you created us in your own image. God, you, we are you. You put you in us. You tell me God can't get angry. Oh, you, 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 you like the God who's soft and gentle and... You don't know what time of the day it is. Then if that's the God you serve, serve that God. But I want a God who knows how to be angry. Because when I get angry, I want him to understand. 
that I can go crazy when I get angry. And I sometimes, I have to have the Holy Spirit says, wait up, Jean, wait, 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 girlfriend, don't go there. I know you brought the kid into the world, but don't go there. I know that you've worked. I know that you've sweated. I know that you've had those sleepless nights, but don't go there. And if I don't feel like speaking to my kids and I cut them off, you know, parents, we have all this power. I brought you in this world, I can take you out. You know all this stuff we say. You ain't getting nothing in my will. All this foolishness that we say. By the time you're 18, you're out of here. Whether you got a job or not, whether you're going to the heart, the stuff that we say is nice. But thank God, thank God that the God in us gives us this compassion, makes us rethink that through. So when I go into an organization and they say, we have to get rid of some folks because they are unproductive, they are not helping us, they are not helping us to get to our bottom line, we need to cut. Dr. Kennedy, you the psychologist, you the OD person. Tell us how to do this. Hurting folks. <laughs> Without damaging people. <laughs> we just need to get to our bottom line. I have to come into that organization and while I know what my charge is, I have to say, God, help me. To help me to see you have grace and mercy. There are people in this organization who rely on this money. There are people in this organization, this is all they got, this is all they can do. This is all they've been doing. Give me a word. So that when I'm sitting with the board of directors and with the CEOs and with their founders, my God, and even with the employees themselves who are burnt out, who feel unproductive, feel like no one can. to be productive or let's unpack seeing your supervisors that you think they don't care about you or what is it that you think you cannot deal with this family and you want out of this family of this church of this organization of this non-profit group even out of your neighborhood but God is so good because we learn to serve God by example yes we don't you can't tell me how to act and, and if you can't show me. I have no concept. Help me to at least see. Give me a choice. So at least I can see what, oh, that's how I'm supposed to act. Well, okay, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But at least you gave me an opportunity to see something different, right? You gave me some choices. God so loved this world that he sent his only son. My God, wait a minute, only son. My womb has been blessed to deliver two children. And I hope that in my old age, one of them got some good sense to take care of their mother. Uh, at least I hope. One of them would say, you know what, God has blessed me with my job, blessed me with my resources, blessed me, and you know what, I don't want my mom to want for anything. I don't want my mom. No, I don't, they don't have to buy me a fancy car. They don't have to buy me jewelry. They don't have to send me on any cruise. And all of that's nice, but they don't really have to. But I want to be able to know that when I am down and out and I call on my daughter, Shireen, Shireen says, Mom, I'm here. I'm dropping everything. You're my mama. I'm on my I'm way. All right. My God. I want, when I go to my son, DeAndre will say, Mom, I'm dropping everything. I'm on my way. I am there for you. I may not always be right in the things I do, but God Almighty, I'm their mother. And God so loved the world that he looked in heaven and didn't send the best angel that sang. Come on, come on, let's unpack this thing. God so loved this that he didn't say, you know what, you, you group of angels over there that takes care of whatever it is you're taking care of in heaven. Them, them those new angels over there that's building their mansions for them folks who can't wait to come up here. They don't want to do anything on earth, but they want to come up to the big mansion. Hmm. God even looked at the Holy Spirit. And he looked and he says, you know what? None of you can do what I need to do for the people that I created. I have to send the most precious thing that is to my heart outside of me going. 
I sent my only begotten son. Only son. I don't have another one. But I'm willing to send him so that he can recognize what it feels like to be human. Because maybe it might just be that as God, I might have forgotten what it feels like to be human. After all, I made Adam and Eve. I gave them a beautiful garden. They messed that up. Then I'm minding my own business trying to make this world a wonderful place. And then these two brothers are arguing and one has to kill one. What the heck is going on with humans? Then I made this beautiful world and they decide they don't want to serve me. And I got to send a flood and mess the whole thing back up and start from scratch. Now, you may not believe all of that. You might think it's just a fairy tale. You, you go with your theology. You go with yours. Let me, let me tell the story the way I know, the way I feel it. But at the end of the day, one thing stands out for me for God so loved this world. He so loved this world with all of its dysfunction, with all of its behavior, misbehavior. He so loved us that he sent his only son to die for us. Why did you have to send your son to die for us? Because I had to be that living sacrifice. I had to show you that I loved you enough that I was not going to hold back anything from you. I gave you my very best. All I want you to do is to give me your best. Isn't that what the brother was just singing about? When God looked at you and I, he saw the best in us. If he saw the other stuff, he would have thought, hey, wipe you off, cut you loose. Uh-uh. What nothing to do with you. You're not what I'm looking for. But he saw the best in us. What a powerful song. Oh, I can't get over it. I can't even move from the song. That's not what I came to preach about. No, I didn't come here to preach on that or teach on that or talk on that. But he saw the best in us. That he sent his only son and sent him to die for you and I. As a matter of fact, he wanted Jesus to suffer so that when you and I are in our places, I would say, God, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand rejection, God. You don't understand a broken heart. You don't understand what it means to lose something. You, God, don't understand. Is there a God anyway? And God reminds us Time and time again. But I loved you. Even before you were born, I loved you. I was thinking about you long before you even came on the scene. I provided an opportunity. Listen, this, this fight is not between you and I. This is a principality. This is a spiritual dynamic fight. God had to say to Satan, you want to fight? You want to fight? All hands. Everything off, take it off. We're going for the kill. This one we're going to fight. Because I'm putting up my son. What are you putting up, Satan? I'm putting my son right out there. What are you bringing to this table? Because I made something that was beautiful that looked like me. And now I have to say to people, if you won't worship me, the very sticks and stones will rise, rise up and worship me. I did not make man to sit back and not worship me. So I have to tell men the very sticks and stones will worship me if you don't. You know what that must mean to God? He's up, I'm telling you. I'm just trying to bring him down so we can understand him a little bit more. But we make God so far off there in another country. We make God so far over there that he's, oh, we've even got colors for God. Look, we've got ethnicities for God. Some people see him as a white God, so he's a God of white privilege. <laughs> Some of us see God as a black man. A black spirit because black life matters. <laughs> Some of us see him as an ancient God for all of the things that went on and, and, and all the wars and all of the things that have taken place in lifestyles of individuals across the nation, across the world. It does not matter. I serve a rainbow God because he is no respect of persons or gender. He says, come as you are. That's the only prerequisite he asks. 
You know, I don't have to pay down a down payments. I don't have to clean it up and fix it up. I come as I am because God loves me. So let me bring this down. And I tell you, every time I go to write a message out, I've got all my little notes here and there and stuff. And I think God just watches and says, that's your exercise. That's just to get you in the right place. Because I need a vessel. Because i got to send a word. Because a word is important. And while my theme scripture is from Matthew 5 about the Beatitudes, I think I've done quite well through the help of the Holy Spirit to show you why it is important for us to recognize what we're going through. Why it is important for us to recognize Jesus himself, who became a human for our sake, became tired at one point, had so many people around him. He needed a break, he needed a getaway, he needed a moment to himself. But God was saying, even, even you, my son, I got a word that I needed to send out. So no, no, don't take your rest just yet. Don't take your rest yet, son. But I, I need you to preach one of the most powerful messages that will be here for eternity. I need you right now to have this crowd, this multitude of crowd. And I need you now to speak my heart. I need you, son, to share my spirit. I need you, son, to encourage the folks. And the Bible tells me in Matthew 5, now when he, Jesus, saw the crowd, he, Jesus, went up on a mountainside and sat down. And as he sat down to rest, his disciples came to him. Listen, 12 disciples. We're, we're worried about big, big numbers in our church. Can we get over that? This is post-COVID. You are, you are not going to have those big numbers in church anymore. Let me say that. Reverend Harris, if you record it, make sure that's get, that gets on there. Forget it. Gone are those days for your entertainment. We come to church an hour before because we can't get the seat that we want. I got my own little parking spot. My parents paid for that particular bench, so don't nobody sit up in that seat. I came to church. Ooh, we know we're going to have a good choir sing today. Ooh, we know we're going to have the best of the best musicians today. Listen, that was good. That was for a season of time. Yeah. And I used that opportunity to help them build for the kingdom of God. While others used it to build up their empires and their names. And for their family's sake and legacy. Nothing wrong in that. I'm a preacher's kid. I think I have the authority and the authorization to say that. I know that lifestyle. Some of our pastors don't know the neighborhood that they're preaching in. That don't make no sense to me. Because you don't know what's going on in my neighborhood. So how in the heck are you going to preach and lift, me, lift up my spirit? You have no idea what it feels like to be in my house and hear something and say, wait, is that a firework? Let's say the 4th of July, girl, it's a gun. Lord have mercy. Who got shot now? Some of you have, have churches in the hood. you got to put a alarm system in place because you don't know who's trying to break in to steal something because they got a habit, they got to feed, and they don't know nowhere else to go. They break into your churches and steal whatever they can. But you're in the hood. You minister in the hood. You haven't been discouraged. So gone are those days when we used to have the big congregations. Gone are those days. And if those... And you've heard me say this before. You thought that you were above the law. I don't care. I'm not wearing a mask. I don't care what they say. I'm going and I'm not going to be wearing a mask. You see them on the north side of town. The more affluent side of town. The ones who have the nicer buildings and the parking lots. And have that big budget for the youth ministries and women's ministries and gala parades. And all of these things that they have. And they'll say, we don't see why we have to wear a mask. We're not, in, we're not inviting the spirit of fear upon us. We're not, we're not to wear a mask. We're okay. It's okay. I know my Bible tells me that obedience is better than sacrifice. And right now we're all trying to pray for a president who's sitting up in the hospital because he didn't think it was necessary to wear a mask. And he probably still don't think it's necessary to wear a mask. But that don't mean you ain't got any good sense. You wear your mask. Because it is a spirit of obedience. And the Bible says if we can be obedient and faithful in a few things, gives us, then he'll give us bigger. And so those churches who think that they don't have to wear a mask, and they look around and they pride themselves for having diversity in their
they're in their congregation, that's wonderful. But they still feel like they're above the law. That's okay. You will pay that price. Your leader is paying that price now. Because if some of you had just said to your president, Mr. President, please, for God's sake, just wear the mask. I know you don't like it. I know some of you don't like it. I know it doesn't make you feel powerful. But brother, brother president, please, just, just wear the mask. For God's sake, for the sake of the country. Because if anything happens to you, it leaves us in a place of national security. Please, President man, just wear the mask. For God's sake, we're praying for you. I think that they could have spoken some good sense into him. So he would not have to be in the hospital. So that his wife wouldn't have to be suffering. So they wouldn't have any after effects. And listen, you can take all the medication you can take. There's always after effects. We all learned that you can't even take too much vitamins over the counter. It'll make you sick. So at the end of the day, God has called us not to build a big empire. He took 12 people, 12 men who were willing and able and said, look, I'm just a fisherman. I don't really know much about trying to do something because this is a revolution. They thought this was revolution. They thought, thank God, finally some guy has come. We don't know. He's a guy from where? Where are you, where are you from? He, isn't he from Capernaum? <laughs> isn't that Joseph's son? Hey, isn't that the young man that they used to see making stuff? He's a carpenter. Hey, isn't that the carpenter's son? Don't know when he got such good sense, but he looked like he's a revolutionary now. And we need him to free us from underneath this Roman government. We need him to get us free. We need our rights. So they weren't even seeing him as a son of God. They just saw him as a good speaker, somebody who could teach, somebody who could say some stuff. They weren't seeing him as the son of God. They didn't see him as the Messiah. Remember that. They just seen him as somebody who cares about their situation. But God said, I had asked before if I saw one, I would save this earth. And I saw one. And when I asked Moses again, can you show me one? Moses says, I stand in the gap. Look, y'all, keep my hand up. As long as my hand is up, we'll win the battle. But, the, the battle. but when my hand goes down, we lose it. Y'all, put some stones underneath my hand. Do some. Hold up my hand so we can have the victory. And throughout the ages of times, there was always one standing in the gap. Even when they messed up like David did, he was still standing in the gap. Even when David had some issues with his family. Because we love to talk about the David, the man of God, with the man, the, the, the heart of God. We don't like to talk about the dysfunction in David's family. We don't like to talk about David didn't have a heart of forgiveness to forgive his own son when he should have forgiven his son. And that young man raised up with anger and heart because his half brother had gone ahead and raped his sister. And he went to his father, David, and said, David, what are you going to do about this? My sister is now committing suicide because she doesn't feel worthy. What are you going to do about this King David? This is your kingdom. David compromised. If it was anybody else, David would know what to do. Sometimes it's harder when it's your family, you know. You can, you can say what you want to say for other people, but when it comes to yours, it's, a, it's another story. It's something different. It ain't as easy as we think it is. You can tell the sister down the street, kick him out. He ain't, you don't want to hear your girl, he ain't working, he will kick him out. <laughs> you can say to the woman, oh, you having trouble with your old man, kick him out. You don't want to go find a job, kick him out. Uh, you can be the supervisor, you can say, I need to get rid of this person. I don't know what this person's issues are, but you know what? Uh, we just need to go hire somebody else. Kick them out. It's so easy for us to do it to other people. But when it comes to us, our own, our place, Dear God Almighty, it becomes a double standard. It's a double standard. That's why we say in social justice, when it hits the right person, the rules change. Oh, we're not saying that out of craziness, like we ain't got nothing better to say. We are saying when it hits the right person, then the law will change. You want police reform? When it hits the right person, you will get police reform. Uh, you want to you get some kind of a regimen for this COVID to, to, to release it to help us know what the plan of action is? When it hits the right person, you will get a plan. <laughs> you want better schools in your neighborhoods? When it hits the right person, you will see better schools. You'll see better housing. You'll see a safer community. You'll see more access to affordable health and affordable housing when it hits the right person. It hasn't hit the right person. 
here. The right person is not there. Jesus saw 12 men, rough and tough, all kinds of The tax collector, oh, you, you don't have him, the thief. Be a, a dis oh, come on, Jesus, you've got to be desperate. I know you can do better than that. Why in God's name are you getting a tax collector? Every time that man comes around, he wants my money. And you gonna have him be quote unquote a disciple? Are you kidding me? Thank God Jesus had his plan. Thank God he knew what his plan was. He knew what his mission is. We must not lose sight of what our mission is, like brothers and sisters. In this fight of social justice, do not lose your fight. Let them call you all that they want to call you. Don't lose your fight. If those brothers and sisters did not stay in Kentucky, we would not even have gotten as far as we got with Brianna Taylor's justice. So sometimes we have to move into another person's city. I said, Reverend Harris, I am so glad that you got your building, brother man. And he looked at me because he knew I was coming with something. I said, brother, there are folks who are called to be uh, protesters. That is their calling to march. That is their calling to speak on justice. And they need a place to stay when they come into your city. They need someone to feed them with some food when they come into your city. They need someone to be there to cover them when they come in your city. You don't have to do the work yourself. God has provided a way. He has provided people to come into your city. Just call them and they will come. Because a prophet has never welcomed his own land. He can say what he says and they don't recognize that. But let the stranger come from outside. Jesus was a stranger to them and they said, hey, he looked like he could be a good king. He looked like he could really get us out of this. He looks like he could really bring us some, some, some rights. Well, we need a big democracy here. That, this, this carpenter guy turned out pretty good after all. He can talk and make some sense. Hmm. Jesus went up to the mountain and he sat down and his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He started off by saying, blessed are the pure, the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor, P-O-O-R, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hmm, we're going to unpack that. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. We're going to unpack that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Don't give up, crowd, you're here listening to me, don't give up. You there that are sitting around, you're tired, you've been following me, watching all these miracles that I've been doing, don't give up. I've got a word for you. I've got a word for you in two season. Listen, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You're going to be filled. And blessed are the merciful, for they will show mercy. You know, sometimes we can't get into something if we haven't lived it. It's, it's, it's hard to understand the mother who's just lost a son to a gun shooting whether it's the police shooting them or a neighbor shooting them or a gang shooting them or somebody who looks like them. I feel a gun is a gun, a shot is a shot. Death is death, it don't matter where it comes from. So you're gonna hurt. You're gonna hurt as much if your son is in the gang as the person who got shot by a bad cop. Because death is death, it's no respective person. Pain is pain, it's no respective person. Huh? But yet God, in his mercies could send this message through his son. And he says, blessed are those who are merciful, for they will show mercy. Now I know what it feels like. Next time I get called in a jury duty, now I'll look at the bullet case. I'll look at it in, in, in its proximity. When Trayvon Martin's uh, um, um, accuser, his, his, his killer, was let go free, Zimmerman, the grand jury told you and I, we didn't have all the facts. They gave us what we gave, and we had, based on what they gave us, we had to go based on that. That was the grand jury. We heard a similar situation just recently with Brianna Taylor. The grand jury says, look, this is what they gave us, and we had to go based on that. Ladies and gentlemen, you are voters for Christ's sake. 
Look at your laws and look at the way things are done. And you have the power. Right now they are begging for your vote. And I hope to God that you plan to vote. 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 That's your, that's your right. And that's your religious right. Jesus said, I didn't come to mess up your system. You render to Caesar what is Caesar, but you better render to God what is God. You, we cannot pray for change if we're not about change ourselves. He did not save us just unto ourselves, but he saved us because he knew he needed that diversity in building the kingdom of heaven. He shows us with the disciples. He has these disciples coming from all walks of life, yeah. all back. He's, he's got a guy who's a doctor, Dr. Luke, who's checking things out. And he brings the humanistic part of it. He looks at the pain. He can talk about the woman with the issue of blood and what it felt like. And what she was thinking and feeling. Because she knew that in her culture, she was not allowed to be around other Jews while she was bleeding. It was not their culture. A bleeding woman, a woman on, on her menstrual cycle was not to be around food. Was not to be around, it was kosher. And she knew she had this issue of blood. We'll call it hemorrhaging. Huh? And we know today, when you hear a woman who stopped her period, and then all of a sudden she's having a period. And you're like, whoa, 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 wait up, wait up, something right here. That's not supposed to happen. She was in that situation. The Bible says she went to all kinds of physicians to find out why am I still having a period? Why am I hemorrhaging? What's going on with me? Now, we know today if a woman is hemorrhaging like that, more likely than not, she's got cancer. Yeah? Because you're not bleeding for the sake of bleeding. There's something going on. You need to go get that checked and find out why are you hemorrhaging? They didn't know about cancer and all that stuff back in the day, but she knew somebody who could heal her. She knew he was no respect of persons. She knew that he would. And in fact, she didn't even want to bother his time. She said, if I could just touch the M of his garment, I believe that virtue's in this man. If I could just touch his M of his garment, not to bother him, not to mess up his program. If I could just touch him, I believe I'd receive my healing. Yeah. And the Bible says she did receive her healing. So see, Jesus was all things to all people. He didn't come to just stay in one lane. He came that justice would be done. We cannot talk about restorative justice, ladies and gentlemen, if we cannot talk about social justice. And I know the church don't want to talk about social justice. That's a worldly thing. That's the stuff they do out there. But let me tell you something, church, this morning. You cannot do restorative justice if you cannot. Restorative justice is taking that which is broken and making it whole again. That is why in restorative justice they had the victim and they had the offender. And those two came face to face. And that victim says, do you know what you did to me, young man? Do you know how I felt when you came in my house and stole my jewelry or stole or you hurt me or whatever the, the, the loss was? And that offender has to listen without interrupting. He has to see the, the tears in her eyes. He has to see all of that. I don't, you know, Reverend Harris, I just thought of something. I don't know why it is that when they have these, these charges with these police killing, why they don't bring in families and let those police hear the pain that has happened to those families. Why in God's name, that is restorative justice. You cannot have social justice without the restorative justice. Restorative justice means nothing. And we have to talk up. And church, it is your mandate to talk. You're not given nothing more but the space in which you live. God gives you two things as, as, as people call to ministry. Your family, because as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That's your first point of action by the way you live. You behave, your family knows whether or not you're a child of God. They know whether or not you believe in love. They know whether or not you believe in forgiveness. They know whether or not you are, you're human. You're going to make mistakes, but it's the way you handle your business after that. So your family gets to see God in you by the way you behave yourself. The second thing that God gives you is your neighborhood. Your neighborhood. You have a mandate, this church. This church, you have a mandate. From the top of that hill, what is that? Um, what is that main street out here? Uh, so, what is it? California. California. From California. Is that where, is that by the um, what is that street where the homeless camp is? What's, is that Divisadera? Ventura. Thank you. From Ventura all the way down to Fresno Street. 
from Ventura all the way down to Fresno Street. That is your turf. I'm pleased to see how many churches are around here. And if your pastors and your leaderships can't get with those other leaders, then say, sit down. What do we need to do to win our neighborhood? Don't win this. We're so into, we got to win the city. We got to win the world. That's why you have those mega churches. They want to win the city and they want to win the world. And there's nothing wrong in that. But those mega churches cannot meet now. Post COVID, they cannot meet. So it's going to take the, the, the smaller churches to be able to go because you've been used to it. You didn't have to worry about trying to find a parking spot. You didn't have to worry about trying to please somebody so that the pastor can't preach freely. He's tied up when he's preaching because he knows if he says what he needs to say, we don't have a problem in losing members. It is your calling. It is your commission. It is your walking papers. It is your order to win this block. And if you don't want to do it with the other churches around because they won't come together and talk and collaborate and see what this neighborhood needs, then you get out there and do that. You get out there and do that. Stop having church the way we have had church in the past. It does not work anymore. We got to do something different. There should not be anybody in this neighborhood that's hungry. They should not experience hunger. They should not go to their bed and not be able to have food the next day. They should not have a child who's doing, not doing well in school, not meeting the grade. Because you can provide the after school enrichment programs. You can help with the reading. You can help with the things that that child needs. The child needs clothes. You can provide that for them. That household, not meeting their bills. They don't know what to do. Listen, you've got a building. And if you don't have to go in the building, put a table and a chair out there. And every Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, whichever day,